Um, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, to add to that introduction a little bit, um, I'm Executive Director of Software Freedom Conservancy. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of Conservancy, Software Freedom Conservancy. Oh. Everybody raised their hands for people who are streaming, which, well, not everybody. I think there were a few people who didn't raise their hands. Uh, oh, good. So some people are confirming that uh, they need to know what Conservancy is. Software Freedom Conservancy is a, a nonprofit umbrella organization, and uh, we're the nonprofit home of about uh, coming up on 40 free and open source software projects. Um, these are logos for some of them. I think most of you use, uh, use one or two of them at least. Um, we're also the uh, home of the GPL compliance project for Linux kernel developers and the Debian aggregation project, copyright aggregation project. Um, I am a lawyer. Please don't throw any rotten fruit at me. <laughs> Um, but uh, I, uh, most of the legal work I do now, all of the legal work I do now is uh, pro bono for organizations like, uh, like the FSF. And uh, I'm a free software enthusiast and an FSF associate member, like probably almost everyone here based on the opening session. And uh, I'm a cyborg. I have a pacemaker defibrillator uh, implanted in my body to which I can't see the source code to. And, uh, it has made me really passionate about software freedom and uh, has made me understand why the, the issues around software freedom are important to everyone and integral to our society. I also really, really, really love this conference. <laughs> it is the best conference. It's such an awesome conference. It's one of the few places that we can get together and talk about the social justice issues around software freedom. And uh, the hallway track, just standing there in the hallway, you hear some of the most insightful, interesting things about free software. So let's give all of the organizers a big round of applause. <laughs> I'm gonna come back to why Libra Planet in particular is, uh, is a very important thing. It, it fits into the context of, of my talk. And my, I'm here to talk to you about companies and free software and you. And so this is sort of a map of our space in terms of uh, the ways in which free software is produced and participated in. We have uh, charities uh, like the Software Freedom Conservancy and the Free Software Foundation. We have uh, many companies um, who are working in this space. We have uh, people who are working for hobby, and we have trade associations and companies. So a lot of these areas overlap in a number of ways. Uh, trade associations are, uh, you know, represent the companies that are members to them, but there are differences in terms of uh, what they, you know, what their, their overall interests are. Um, and there are schools and there's government. Um, so uh, uh, that's sort of the, 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 the overall background and, um, you know, I think we can all agree that companies, that company interest in free software is totally awesome, right? Like, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's, um, uh, it's, it's what we want. <laughs> raise, your, raise your hand if you work for a company that, you know, has free software as a component of, 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 your, of your job. And raise your, keep your hands raised, and raise your hand if you work for a company that uses free software, even if your work is not a part of that. So like, also almost everyone. So uh, particularly from the first set, for people who raise their hands that they're working for companies, you know, in, and, and doing free software as a part of their jobs, that's a really fantastic outcome for free software because we have free software produced and, uh, you know, and, and by people who are passionate about it and that work is being used in the service of uh, for-profit interests and, um, you know, and, and uh, that is actually, you know, really fantastic. There's this expression that I use that I think I found out about or thought about from my time as a corporate lawyer. Uh, uh, way back in the beginning of my career, I was a securities lawyer of all things. I, I worked on uh, stocks and bonds and uh, a little bit of M&A and a little bit of bankruptcy and like really like serious law firm corporate law. And the term that we use then to describe some of these things is to say that our interests are aligned. And 
Uh, and so there are, there are often cases where, um, you know, where our interests as a free software community and our interests um, with, you know, and the interests of companies are exactly the same thing. So I cribbed this slide. This is out of the Linux Foundation, uh, which is a trade association. Um, I cribbed this out of their materials, and it's this. Uh, it basically shows all the great places where uh, where Linux is, um, and uh, some of this is GNU Linux. Um, but uh, but so there's uh, you know all these these great for-profit enterprises. They have some um, some other um, areas as well. But when companies focus on areas that we're also interested in, that means that, uh, and I say we very loosely, <laughs> uh, but where the free software community is interested in, amazing things can happen. And free software can get into lots of places. Um, but uh, as we heard in our, uh, the opening session with uh, Edward Snowden, he said, well, sometimes corporations are on our side and sometimes stand up for the public interest we should not have to rely on them. And there's, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, because sometimes companies don't act the way we want them to act. <laughs> sometimes they don't. <laughs> sometimes they don't do the things we wish they would do when it comes to the GPL. Um, and, and actually, can I see a show of hands? Who here is new to free software? Who here? So there are quite a number of people who are new here to free software. How many people are, this LibrePonit is their first free software conference? Let's give these people a round of applause. <laughs> Welcome. So for, for, for you guys, just to step back, uh, the GPL is the, uh, is, is a license that's, uh, that relies on copyleft. And the Software Freedom Conservancy uh, represents the, uh, some kernel developers who are interested in making sure that companies who use uh, their software that is licensed under this copyleft license follow the rules. And last year here at Libre Planet, I talked about, um, I gave a whole talk about the lawsuit that was brought by Christoph Helwig against VMware to uh, make sure that VMware follows the rules and follows the license and publishes the source code uh, when they made a derivative work of the Linux kernel. So uh, uh, there's, uh, there, I give a whole talk on that. And uh, you know what is, what is interesting about that that I bring it up here is that what happens often with companies is that they walk as close to the line as they possibly can. So it's in their financial interest to, uh, to release as little as possible, in part because, uh, you know, for, for many reasons, that uh, some of which we'll get into. Um, and companies have different aims as to whether they're looking at their long-term interests or their quarterly results. And, you know, I think Volkswagen was a really good example of this because I think everyone has seen that what Volkswagen did to game the system did not work out for the long-term financial interests. In fact, by, by, not doing what, uh, by not doing the ethical thing, it turns out that the company lost quite a bit of money um, in doing that. And you sort of have to think about the engineers and developers that were in-house at Volkswagen. And you know, the, if these engineers knew that the company was behaving unethically, but felt like they couldn't say anything. And that focus on short-term results very negatively impacted the long-term results. And this is, unfortunately, how companies are often structured. Not all companies are like this, but many companies are focused on turning their quarterly results. And they're not thinking about their, the success of their business over the next decade. So that's one way in which, uh, that's one way in which company interests might differ from the public's interests, because the public is definitely interested in uh, the long-term well-being um, of the public with respect to the company's goods and products. Um, and the company is mostly interested in turning a profit. Um, so I put up a picture of my defibrillator here. And the reason why I, meant, why I bring it up now is that when I recently, and I don't necessarily like to talk about this too much, in public, but when I was uh, pregnant, which uh, uh, happened recently, I was shocked 
by my defibrillator twice. So the reason why that happened was that my heart did things that a normal pregnant woman's heart does. It, um, you know, pregnant women often have their hearts race when they're pregnant. Uh, but my defibrillator was not programmed with that in mind. The class of people, the number of people who are women who could be pregnant and who also have these medical devices is incredibly low. When I was in the hospital giving birth, I had a really great chat with them. I always talk about software freedom in the hospital. It's fantastic. I highly recommend it. <laughs> doctors, doctors are always really fascinated by it, and it's so relevant to basically everything that happens to you um, in, the, you know, in, in the hospital. There's equipment everywhere, and it's all running proprietary software, and, uh, and doctors are very smart people who are very concerned about liability <laughs> and also are, are often doctors because they really care about people and making them well. And it's really like an awesome time to advocate for free software. And they're not expecting you to do that because you're a patient and you're vulnerable, but, uh, but it's, it's really fun <laughs> in that way. And so the doctors, when I was talking to them about it, I would say, oh, if you have a patient with a defibrillator, um, you know, and I started talking about some of the, the things that I had learned and the, you know, the anesthesiologist I was talking to said, let me stop you right there. You know, I've been doing this for decades, and you are my second patient with a defibrillator. So there simply are not a lot of women who have defibrillators who have babies. Which means that it's not really in Medtronic's interest to anticipate my problem. Now, Medtronic has no interest in pregnant women getting shocked. That is probably the last thing they want. <laughs> a lot of pregnant, you know, pregnant women with defibrillators having stories about being unnecessarily shocked. But it does mean that they're not looking for, they're not looking to address my problem, right? So my situation is not necessarily one that they have an interest or even that they would be aware of. But because my software is proprietary, I can't hire my own team of medical professionals to assist me with a, 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 you know, with my own, with tailoring my own medical experience. Um, and so that's a, 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 you know, a frustrating thing for me as a free software um, advocate. But in terms of how that represents company interests, it's perfectly reasonable for Medtronic to not really be spending tens of thousands of dollars and or or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in making sure that I don't get an unnecessary shock. Right? It's another example of where company interests and the public's interests are not necessarily aligned, not for any nefarious reason, but because they're not out for the same aims. So I actually had this slide free versus open the very first time that I spoke at Libra Planet, which was many years ago, actually. And, uh, and what I, the point of the slide when I had it up then was to say, I was giving like a legal talk at the time, and I was saying, you know, the saying free, if, 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 if software is free software or free software is open source software, we're really talking about the same thing, right? And I, I still agree with that, but on the other hand, as time has gone by, I've sort of realized that we often are talking about different things with different goals. And I've actually sort of, I, I, at the time, I thought I was kind of like giving a big zing, you know, like I'm coming to Libra Planet and I'm saying free versus open, it doesn't matter, you know. Um, and, and I got some small reaction from that and I felt very pleased with myself at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but in, in, all, in the time since then, I've actually, I, I've started to feel bad about that because I realized that I was helping to move some of the attention away from the ideology of software freedom and, and to the result of having more free software out there. And those are two different things. And, they're in, and that's interesting and important when it comes to thinking about the ways in which we interact with the companies that are in our space. So I don't know how many of you watched Silicon Valley, uh, which is a, a TV show, uh, like a, a sitcom. Uh, but I started watching it, and uh, the very first episode, there's like a VC party, and uh, there's a guy on stage who is like the founder of the company. And he, 
Uh, you know, it's, it, there are jokes, many different levels of jokes, and it's very, very funny. But, uh, but the, 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 the guy basically winds up saying, all that matters is that we're making the world better. And he's like basically like shilling his company, but saying that he's making the world better by effectively selling to this VC funding and making a big profit. And this is a joke throughout the entire sitcom. And this is a, a, an example of like the, the, uh, the, a poster from one of the, uh, the, the big companies in the sitcom. And it's all about making the world a better place, making the world a better place. And I felt ill watching Silicon Valley <laughs> because it's what companies are doing now. And they have been for some time. There's a co-option of our message. And uh, Bradley Kuhn, who I work with, has talked a lot about this. Um, and, uh, and I'm inclined to, to agree with him. And it's not that the companies aren't doing good things sometimes, uh, because many of them are. Um, but the co-option of the message of just saying, we participate in open source software and acting as if that is like some huge, you know, their, their goal is to make the world better so you should trust them and use their products is misleading. And what's worse about it is that it detracts from the free software ideology message. And it makes it harder for us to explain why what we're doing is really important. And you know, I, I, I've talked to, um, you, know, I've, I've, you know, when I've had, had conversations with people about why I'm a, a software freedom advocate and why I care about this stuff, the first reaction people often have is, well, you know, why don't you just get a job at a big company? Like, what, what, why are you working at a charity? Like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> you're a lawyer, and you're, you're, you're working at it. Why aren't you going out and making the big bucks and get hire, hired by a big company? Because they do open source. They care about open source. And, you know, the answer is it's a, it's a different, you know, it, there are different aims. Our interests are not always aligned. Um, and what I have found from working at Conservancy is that working on... Uh, GPL enforcement is extremely eye-opening. So I am a real optimist by nature. So uh, when we started working on GPL enforcement, of course, my first thought was, well, companies will want to comply. You know, we'll just explain to them why it's in their interests and our interests and everybody's interests to comply fully with the license to share their source code when they're supposed to. Like, surely this is going to be an easy task. And I also, I also thought that this was something that everybody would want. And that if we took on GPL enforcement in a friendly and nice way, and if we, you know, if we were always so reasonable and always so nice and always, you know, helped out as much as we could, that this would be completely unobjectionable. It would not be political. It wouldn't be a big deal. And I have to say that I was dead wrong. I was really, really, really surprised by that. Now, some people are laughing here because they think, how could you have ever been so naive to think that that was the case? And now I'm in inclined to agree with them because the pressure that I have seen to not enforce the GPL has been really great. And the efforts of, um, you know, of, of the efforts of, of companies to exert their influence on the, uh, on the path of GPL enforcement has been, um, has been very impressive to me. And what, uh, what was very difficult for us was, uh, and I mentioned this last year, that we had uh, uh, for-profit donations that were threatened to uh, be uh, taken away from Conservancy because of this. And, uh, and I've found that to be the case repeatedly that when I make the case for you should support conservancy to for-profit companies, often the answer I get back is, oh, well, you know, you, you bring lawsuits, so we don't want anything to do with you. Um, we would rather fund something that is, um, you know, is less controversial. And my response is, this shouldn't be controversial. This isn't controversial. But, uh, but the answer is that it, 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 it apparently is to companies. And it's, uh, it's really, really been baffling to me, and it has really driven home the point of the fact that company interests and 
the ideological community's interests and the public's interests are not all the same thing. And uh, it's been a, a really interesting thing for me to come to understand. And if you're following uh, Software Freedom Conservancy at all, you'll see that we launched a, a fundraiser around this to try to pivot our business model away from relying on company donations and towards individuals. And the reason for that is that then we're not as subject to the whims of companies. Um, you know, Conservancy is a kind of nonprofit that I'm, I'm proud to work at a place where we would rather shut down than, um, than compromise. And it's... <laughs> You applaud, but it's just not worth it, right? I mean, it's a charity. We should be working in the public interest. Why? You know, it's 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 so difficult. Um, it's difficult to sustain, but it's the only way forward. It it should be the way that all charities are, and the fact that that's not necessarily the case is is upsetting. But uh, um, but anyway, so the point is is that. We really want to work with companies. We need companies. There's so much advantage to working with companies on free software. When free software is used by companies in their products and, you know, and there's compliance with the licenses, everybody wins. It's, it's one of these like, fantastic, amazing situations. And I, was, I remember when I was new to this field, I was like so high on this idea. And the fact that the charities were being so supported by the companies that were the donors and the fact that, that there could be no strings attached donations because everyone was going for the same thing it was just so exciting and seductive. And I want it to be the case all of the time, but it simply is not the case. And so uh, I guess I said I was an optimist by nature, but I'm a lawyer. So as a lawyer, I'm a pessimist by training. <laughs> and, um, and what I learned uh, in being a lawyer is that you have to plan for the worst case scenarios. And what I've learned as a free software advocate is you have to plan for those situations because they will arise. You know, we can't expect companies who are acting in their financial interest to always act in the community's best interest. So, um, you know, it's about the power balance. And the really cool thing about licensing like the GPL is that it, it has, uh, it, it, it puts this great infrastructure in place where, uh, you know, where the community, where individuals, where users have, have power. And I wanted to sort of examine the ways in which we can tilt the power balance back into our direction, right? So we've had this period of time where, uh, where as companies have become more and more active in free and open source software, they've encouraged more lax permissive licensing. Um, and they've become involved in, um, in the governance of free software projects. And again, not all, like, I'm, I, I don't want to point, like, really put a, a, a point on the fact that I don't think that, I'm not saying anything is bad about company involvement in free software. I think it's essential and, um, and fantastic. But I think we can set up ways of, of, of dealing with companies that, uh, such that we tip the balance of power a little bit back more towards ideology. Um, obviously, one of the key ways is to go uh, is copyleft licensing and the GPL in particular. Uh, this is a, a uh, logo that was put together by Chris Weber. I don't know if he's here, but it's super awesome and I love it. Oh, Why he's the right there. Hole on the, left side? the hole is for uh, it's like the copyleft. It's like a C, but instead of the C, it's a heart. So it's like the classic <laughs> copyleft logo. <laughs> <laughs> but but as as the person next to you is pointing out, you could also interpret it as like sharing the love, like a, the opening of the well of copy left to love upon the world. <laughs> so, um, so uh, so so we've had this period of time over the past few years where companies have really uh, gotten the message out that if you want adoption you need to go with a lax permissive license. If you want companies to use your software, you, you, know, you should not even consider the GPL, because if you consider the GPL, um, especially V3, but any version at all, you know, the companies won't adopt it. And it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a funny message to have heard. How many people have heard that directly from a company that they've worked with, that a lax permissive license is the only way that their software would get uh, traction? So quite a number of people. Um, so Martin Fink gave this really interesting, he's a CTO of 
HPE Hewlett Packard Enterprises. He gave this really interesting keynote at LinuxCon Europe um, where he talked about it from a company's perspective and talked about the benefits of copy left. And, um, you know, and he sort of said, we need to get away from this, uh, this messaging that we've had out there of lax permissive licensing is the, um, you know, is the only way that companies are willing to participate because it's not actually in the interest of companies in the long term. And the way he put it was, we should change the default back. And he had like a slide with a pendulum swing. And it was very powerful for me to hear that coming from someone who's, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, an important person within a for-profit company getting out there and saying that there is now, you know, that we need a shift back to copy left because it's in, um, you know, it's in companies' interests uh, as well. Um, uh, Shauna had a, a really... Shauna, are you here? Okay, there's Shauna right up there. Um, uh, in her talk, she t t earlier today, um, I, I was uh, reviewing the slide. She was talking about resisting monopolies and other centralized power structures. So the GPL um, is a is a great tool, but we need to make sure that we don't have centralized, uh, uh, you know, we don't have GPL projects that are centralized in um, in for-profit companies. So it's a you know it, it works best when we have more copyright holders and uh, and it, you know conservancy accepts for example and I know FSF accepts copyright assignment um, and those are charitable organizations but also there are other copyright holders that are part of the upstream project. Um, so so one of the ways I think that uh, that. So just to get back, one one of the ways that we could really uh, get back to uh, you know can control that balance of power a little bit better is by insisting on copy left. So when you're uh, if you're in a company and you're working on a new software project and you're considering licensing, don't just assume that Black's permissive licensing is the way to go. Raise the conversation and and try to push it. Meet privately with the lawyers in the organization and ask them what they think. Tell them about the long-term, like the long-term benefits of using copy left, how the ecosystem will look, the kinds of partners that they'll have. Um, you, as as employees of companies, have a lot of power to influence the the, the lawyers if you'll sit down with them and have that conversation. Um, I think lawyers have this tendency to sort of just say no, um, and it's been very trendy to go with less permissive licensing. But when you can point to um, talks like the Martin, Martin Thinks talk, you start having the, um, the ability to, um, to really push that conversation more and, and try to, to really, really push for copy left because that's one of the key ways that we're going to balance the power between company control of free software and, um, and what's good for the public and good for us. Um, employment agreements is another really interesting uh, way that you can level the playing field. How many people here have signed an employment agreement with their employers? So a lot of people, um, without asking too much about your <laughs> employment agreement, how many of you modified your employment agreement when you signed on? How many of you negotiated it? So like half of like, or like maybe like a third of those people, that's really impressive. That's a lot of people. A lot of people don't know that employment agreements, like almost all agreements, can be negotiated. So when you're asked to sign on to it, like when you get hired for a job, you uh, and you're served the paperwork, it's not necessarily the case that the company won't take any changes to it. So you should sit down and read it. See what, well, you definitely should read any agreement that you sign. <laughs> but, but, but especially for your employment agreement, take the time to think about how that impacts your contributions to free software. Because you will never have as much power as you do the moment you are being, like before you have agreed to the job. Once you've gone through the interviewing process and a company has extended a job offer to you, you are never more valuable to them. They don't want to have to go and interview more people. They've decided that you're the perfect person for the job. They want to hire you. Once you take the job, you no longer have that kind of negotiating power. Right? Once you take the job, the terms of your employment are fixed. And we're still, like, from the moment, even if you get it amended, whatever happened from the beginning of your employment is the, the situation for that. You know, you, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle to get things changed once you're already working there. Um, so, so how many people here who modified their agreement or I guess or didn't, but there's no way that this would they would be. Okay, how many people here <laughs> modified their agreement? Uh, how many people 
keep their own copyrights on their code. So like yet like uh, like maybe a third of that third can keep the copyright. See, it is possible, which a lot of people don't realize. Some companies allow their employees to keep their copyrights. And this is a very interesting thing to ask for. I think many companies, probably most companies, especially right now, won't necessarily agree to individuals, keep, to employees keeping their own copyrights. But if more employees ask for this, it becomes something that companies become aware of. And more importantly, companies will see that people are interested in this, and it may become a recruiting tool. So you could, you know, parlay one offer against another and say, instead of just saying that other company is offering me $10,000 more, you can say that other company is offering for me to keep my copyrights, or I will take your job offer tomorrow if you will let me keep my copyrights. And this is uh, definitely a really excellent way of shifting the power balance um, to keep more control and to keep companies acting in the interests um, that are more aligned with the free software community. I'm going to call, I'm, I'll, I'll take any questions mid, mid talk um, so anyone can raise their hands, but Richard. <laughs> I'd just like to mention that it, another thing you might find it useful to offer is I'll take the job tomorrow if you agree that I can give copyrights to the Free Software Foundation or some other such organization. Yeah, that's a really they excellent might, point. You know, they might not be willing to agree to a bigger thing. They might not be willing to let you keep it and maybe go into a business with it, but they might agree to give it to the FSF. Yeah, Richard they makes an... say, you can keep the copyright provided you agree you will only publish it under, G under some versions of the GNU GPL. Yeah, Richard makes a couple of excellent, excellent points, um, you know, saying that you can also ask, um, ask for, for the FSF or another organization to, um, to hold the copyrights to your co-contributions. And, um, and I would say that actually Conservancy is in discussions with a very big company right now um, where they're actually contemplating uh, assigning a chunk of their copyrights to Conservancy. Um, so thinking that this is completely out of the question is, you know, is, is it, isn't quite right. Um, and in fact, um, you can just ask the question in a really friendly way. And, uh, and what I found, especially with negotiating employment agreements, that provided that you sort of say, like, you know, I understand that, you know, that, that you've given me these terms, but I'd like to find out if, if you would move on them, if you would give me, you know, a little bit more flexibility, if you would let me keep my copyrights, or if you would let me assign my copyrights to someone else, um, you know, is, is something that companies might actually consider. Um, I think a lot of people don't even realize that companies modify their terms of employment at all, but, uh, but, but many do. Um, I overheard this uh, in the hallway track today, which uh, is that at-will employment fundamentally misunderstands the dynamic between employer and employee. And I think there are a lot of really interesting issues that come up between the relationships between companies and free software and their employees. Um, and uh, I've heard all these kind of interesting ideas coming out of LibrePlanet, including ideas about free software uh, employee, free software advocates unionizing. Um, there have been really interesting discussions around these employment relationships. And I think that uh, LibrePlanet is one of the few places where these kinds of conversations happen and tossing around these ideas about ways that we can really um, affect these balances of power and, um, and help free software developers um, and contributors do, um, you know, do great work in free software within the context of companies and making sure that those interests are aligned a little bit more. Um, and LibrePlanet is, is just a really um, awesome place to have that kind of conversation, which I really haven't heard um, in a lot of other places. And the last place that I wanted to mention where you can help effectuate this balance of power is to support the nonprofits like FSF and Conservancy. Um, I have been amazed at the difference that it, I've, I've had when talking to, um, uh, when talking to especially like industry lawyers, so lawyers and other executives at free and open source software um, focused companies. I've been surprised at how their tone has changed in talking to me since we have, uh, we have, we at Conservancy 
started our fundraising campaign where we pivoted away from corporate funding to individual funding. Um, Conservancy now has just under a thousand supporters. And what, <laughs> thanks to everybody here who is a supporter, it makes a huge difference. And the fact that we can say, you know, the fact that we, we, we show that we have almost a thousand people in, you know, in a few months who have signed up shows that people really care about this issue. And so, you know, companies, when I had talked to them in the past about some of this stuff, had tried to say to me, Karen, you're, you know, you're such an idealist. And actually, one, uh, one company lawyer gave me a, um, a pin that actually says, I'm an idealist one day. It's like, you're such an idealist. You, you. Um, that person was being, actually, was being very nice. But it was such a funny, like, hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. you're, you know, you're, you're an idealist, but... But what makes you think that other people care? Nobody else cares. Nobody cares about the GPL. You know, you think that people care about proprietary kernel modules. You think people care about companies that are violating. All they care about is that there are jobs. All they care about is that people are working in free software. Nobody cares about, you know, the, the esoterics of the license and true compliance. Like, you know, and now I can say, I've got a thousand people, I mean, not quite a thousand people, but I've got a thousand people who, 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 you know, who say otherwise. And, you know, and I think that that's part of the importance of supporting free software nonprofits is in indicating to the world that they matter, indicating that these principles matter, and, and empowering an organization that can act on many people's behalves um, to do, to, to, to stand up and say the right thing when often an individual either won't be heard or feels like they can't. So, uh, you know, this is, supporting charities is such, a, and, then, and then the other part of it is, of course, I would be lying if I didn't say there was a, a huge financial component to it, too, which is that if you're living hand-to-mouth like many nonprofit charities are, if you have a corporate donor, say, like a company, say, we're going to pull our $10,000 that we're donating to you, that really hurts, you know? And, uh, and it, it means that a lot of nonprofits sort of take on work that is, in, at least inoffensive to companies, right? Like, is, is fundable, and it, and it distracts resources that could be out there really fighting the good fight, really working on the most important issues, and instead diffuses them towards other issues that are more benign um, to companies. So again, a lot of the interests are aligned with companies, and when they are aligned, fantastic. But we need to set up infrastructure, we need to plan for the times where they're not aligned. Um, and supporting free software charities is a really important part of that. And I have a Conservancy supporter logo uh, because I'm from Conservancy, and I want you guys, each and every one of you, to sign up as a supporter now. <laughs> but, uh, but but it's uh, it's generally true, and I want you to support all of the free software nonprofits in this space. Um, we could not have LibrePlanet as we have it now if the FSF, you know, were not supported. If the FSF weren't there, so. You know, and LibrePlanet in particular, it's, it's, the, it's, it's where the microphone is, right? So we have a lot of conferences in free and open source software. LibrePlanet is so special, as I was talking about at the beginning, because it's such a community um, conference. It's so very socially, social justice oriented, which is extremely unusual. You know, almost all of the conferences that now exist um, for free and open source software are run by companies or by corporate interests. And it means that they get to control where the microphone is. They get to control who has a voice, who gets a keynote, who is standing on stage. I've had talks rejected since I started working on GPL enforcement, even though those talks were not about um, in enforcement or compliance, even though they were about other issues that I thought were benign. And I found out that. Um, that in, in more than one situation that it was because I had been involved with GPL enforcement, not because my talk was not very interesting. Although that could have been it too. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but I found out that the actual reason was that that's the case. And when we don't support community organizations, we cede the microphone to these corporate interests, which are not necessarily our interests. And so I just want to leave you with with that thought about LibrePlanet and how special it is that you are all here and uh, that the FSF and Conservancy and other free software charities exist. And to end with applause for the LibrePlanet staff again, because this is a fantastic conference and incredibly important.
So I don't know if we, I, you're getting a standing ovation. So this is awkward because you're all applauding the Libra Planet. But does anybody have any questions about my talk about companies and free software? I wanted to end thanking Libra Planet and, uh, and thanking the FSF because it's so important. But does anybody have any questions about uh, companies and free software, the power dynamics, things that we should do in order to make sure that our interests are? And I won't be offended if people run out, uh, especially if they want to bid on the GNU. I don't know if it's, it's over yet. But no, it's not over. So if people are, want to bid on those baby GNUs, go, go, go. Uh, but does anybody want to ask a question about um, how copyleft functions, how, you know, in this environment, employment agreements, or other infrastructures that we could put in place? Hi. Uh, hello. Hello. Is that working? Hello? Right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I really appreciate your work. Like, it sounds to me like you honestly really get it in a real way. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I, I suppose, could you like maybe give me like a list of like the worst offenders in terms of kind of pulling the strings against like reasonable copyright? Wow. So, so I actually... I mean, don't, don't burn bridges. But well, you know. I actually took out, I had some concrete examples in my talk and I deleted them all. Because the thing is that today's violators are tomorrow's contributors, you know? Like people who are not participating right now who are trying to push the limits if we can help them understand why they're in the, why it's in their benefit to participate in the long run, they, they can become a part of the community. And if we do public shaming, then those companies are never going to become a part of our community productively. So I'm, you, you won't catch me listing the worst offenders, no, but we kind of a, all know who they are. That's a very reasonable <laughs> answer. Thank you. Okay. I would like to add something. If you're a student, or if you're involved with a university, you'll have almost the same problems that employees of a company will have. And, but it's not quite the same situation because the, the university is not insisting on making some money off your work. It's just looking for a chance to possibly do so. So what I recommend is, well before you have anything in any sort of usable state, demand permission to uh, release it and demand the license you want and say, I won't make this work in a usable way unless you agree. I'll, if you don't agree to releasing it as free software, I'll do just enough that I can prove some concept and write a paper and there'll be nothing of any use to anybody. <laughs> so your choice is, Something with the university's name on it that lots of people will enjoy or nothing except a paper. You have to show that you are stubborn and firm. Well, so there are different ways of approaching the same problem. And I totally agree that universities are often in the same situation as employers. Um, you know, it's, it's for-profit companies and that you should ask the question. But you should sort of like... You don't need to start there. At, you don't need to necessarily start at saying my way or the high, like like I will I will become difficult for you if I don't you know if you don't license freely. You should start out with the I'd like to license this freely. Of course you would like to do that too, right? I, I guess you're right. <laughs> the point is, do this. Don't wait till you have a program ready to release. Bring this up when it's totally useless and fragmentary. No, it's, 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 it's absolutely true. It's excellent. It's working yeah. the less power you've got. It's excellent negotiating advice in any situation. Like, negotiate these terms up front because, you know, there's nothing, there's, there's less at stake. So it's easier for them to agree with you at the beginning before you've done something useful that needs to be released. Well, when you've done it, they can just say, it's ours, we're taking it, whether you like it or not, fuck you. Uh, and, but if it's not working yet, they can't do that. Uh, by the way, is Veronica Dacchino here? She's right okay. up there in the back, so you can connect with her. Thanks, Richard. Happy hacking. Happy hacking. So, so I have something that's a suggestion, and 
maybe the opposite of shaming. Uh, so I'm right now a lawyer for a free software company that's just starting up, and uh, I'm looking to the examples of people who are doing things right for what our company policies are going to be. And I'm fortunate that I'm getting in to, to start doing that. But uh, other people like don't, who don't know where the resources are or don't know what they can bring to their company council, maybe it would be a good thing to to have a list of resources to point to for people who want to do things right or want to know what they can bring to their company that's been accepted already. Yeah, that's a really good point. And Conservancy is really focused on trying to provide constructive resources. It's why we uh, worked with the FSF on copyleft.org. We're really interested in providing concrete information that's available for companies. I would say that every time we've had a negotiation with a company, when they've come into compliance, we've offered and tried enthusiastically to encourage having a press release over it but companies are not interested in saying in having that happen. So we'd like to have an opportunity to applaud the good actors when it happens, but companies are reluctant to do that because in doing that, they're acknowledging past liability. And so they're less like, I mean, Kat is a lawyer here, so it's a little bit disingenuous of me to be like, so there's this thing called past liability, but for everybody else here, so the reason why Conservancy hasn't been, uh, doesn't celebrate the companies that have come into compliance is because those companies don't want to be celebrated. I'd say even things like employment agreements that people can look at when they're negotiating their own, like if, if anybody's willing to make those public, if you're trying to do the, the right thing, making those public might be useful then. Definitely. Conservancy is working on a project uh, for, uh, on clauses for employment agreements to sort of make this a little bit more transparent. Oh no, one more question. Okay. Uh, I have a free documentation license question. Uh, so we are. Is you, are you asking about like you're giving a situation about a free documentation license situation? Talk to me after, and let's have someone who has a question about companies and free software. So who is the next person in line? Thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just. Where can I find a list of reasons? Oh. Where can I find a list of reasons that I can give to an employer about why I should have my own copyright? That's another thing that we're working on. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of, um, a lot of, there's a lot of material out there about the corporate interests in free software, why companies should use free software. And uh, actually we had, uh, I think two years ago, I gave a talk here on free software messaging and we started collating messaging that has been put together that's been available for why free software is important, why it's a good choice, materials for companies and materials for the public. And uh, I think that's maintained on the Libra Planet website, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. How's that? Yes. Thank you, Karen. Um, I have a bunch of people to thank, and I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Um, thank you all for coming to Libre Planet 2016. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Um, yes. First and foremost, I want to thank. Um, for the last few years, we've been able to be here at the Status Center because the Free Software Foundation has partnered with the Student Information Processing Board. It's a student group here at MIT. Um, this year, their main organizer was Austin Duffield, who I want to thank, and I think he has a little bit of something to say. Thanks, Georgia. Definitely, just briefly, I wanted to, on behalf of SIPMI and on behalf of MIT, welcome you guys here. Thank you guys for coming. Um, you guys are an eclectic bunch, and it's been great having you guys here and letting this conference happen and seeing all of the great things that are talked about and that, that happen here. Um, I also really want to thank Georgia and the people from FSF who I've worked with. Um, they've done a lot of heavy lifting over the last couple months, and the conference turned out great. So. Uh, definitely big round of applause for them, and I'm sure Georgia is about to thank more people, so I won't go into depth. Okay. I have a huge list of volunteers to thank. Uh, Libre Planet would not happen without a ton of wonderful community members, in addition to all of you who are attendees. Uh, a bunch of people who have given their time, both this weekend and in the weeks leading up to the event, um, helping out with everything from folding t-shirts to room monitoring to making sure that our streaming and AV needs are met. Um, I think those have gotten better every year. Um, so I'm going to really fast read a list of names and 
Any omissions do not imply lack of appreciation. They are simply human error. Um, so I want to thank Alice A, Sharon R, Frank, Alexander S, Ben C, L Brockman, Polly P, Herman P, Jason F, Kendra A, Ian G, Anthony M, Devin U, Kevin P, Emily G, Sengun E, Bethania M, Alan B, Liz V, Tom B, Amber S, Johnny S, Marina S, Evan M, that's halfway through, Cynthia, Mariah V, Patrick E, Brian R, Spencer L, Ian D, Jeffrey J, Chris T, Hallie, who helped organize the Crypto Corner that I hope some of you checked out, Helen J, Brendan K, Alan C, Matthew C, Jason F, Crystal L, Jordan B, Andrew S, Max D, Heidi H, Edgar F, Andrew S, Dan F, and John D. Uh, if you want to stand and be recognized, that would be awesome, but no pressure. Um, <laughs> and there are... Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and there are two people that I was asked to recognize separately, and I totally agree. Um, Andrew, a longtime volunteer with the FSF, and David, our intern this winter, um, were instrumental in making particularly the streaming and all of the AV needs for this conference happen. We couldn't have done it without them. It was so amazing. Um, I think it's improved every year and we really appreciate them and they're sitting up front. Thank you guys so much, so much. Okay, now I would like to have all of my colleagues, the staff of the Free Software Foundation, come down here. Uh, thank you, because we, we all put a lot of time and energy into this huge collaborative effort. Uh, I think we're probably all looking forward to catching up on sleep. Um, these people are Lisa McGinnis, Ruben Rodriguez Perez, Kosa, Jasmine Huang, Chrissy Himes, Joshua Gay, Donald Robertson, Jeannie Rosada, Zach Rogoff, Stephen Mahood, and our executive director and our new deputy director, who are both conveniently or confusingly, depending on your opinion, named John. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I'm almost done. We have a few sponsors to thank. They have all helped the Libre Planet grow and become better and better over the last few years through their support. Audeo, the Open Invention Network, Google, and Whole Foods Market. Yay. <laughs> Three final things, not four fast things like yesterday. Um, one, when you go out into the lobby, there are paper surveys at the registration desk. We would love to have your feedback, your criticism, your ideas for how to make Libre Planet better. Um, I believe there's also a link for you to do that online, but if you do it on paper, it's totally 100% anonymous. Also at the desk, uh, you can make final bids on those two baby GNUs, Edward and Snowden. Um, we had 60 speakers this year at Libre Planet from the United States, India, Mexico, France, Canada, Germany, Brazil, the United Kingdom, and at least one from an undisclosed location. <laughs> some of those people and some of our attendees were able to be here because of generous donations to the Libre Planet Scholarship Fund. Thank you if you donated, and if you haven't donated before, think about it. It's one of the things that helps make this conference more accessible to a broader, more interesting group of people. It makes our conference welcoming. So thank you, past donors, and thank you, future donors. Uh, and I think the last thing I have to say uh, is that the conference is about to close. Immediately afterwards, the Free Software Foundation's Defective by Design campaign is holding a demonstration against a proposal to make digital restrictions management part of web standards. It's being debated by the World Wide Web Consortium, and they met today. 
Uh, if you go into the lobby and you would like to participate, you will see people who will help with that. I think that's it, unless John wants to say anything. Yes. You missed, you missed one person to thank. Okay. <laughs> Please, a round of applause for Georgia Jung. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. That's it. We're done. Thank you so much. I hope we see you next year. Thanks.